From UDO in partnership with TSN, welcome to episode 30 of the Ray and Dregs Hockey Podcast. Ray, my good friend, it's International Nurse Appreciation Day as we record episode 30 of Ray and Dregs. And uh, I mean, all frontline healthcare workers are near and dear to all of our hearts, but um, who doesn't know a nurse and who doesn't appreciate the sacrifice that these people are having to live through now as we continue to battle COVID-19? Well, j- just think, Dregs, they're, they're just going to do their job. However, their job just got exponentially more dangerous and more difficult and more uncertain. And yet, you know, we, we talk about thanks and we talk, you know, we, you know, in, in our neighborhood, everybody is banging pots at seven o'clock every night. And, yeah. you know, there was one night it was raining and the, the kids are like, you know, do we have to go out in the rain? And we're like, yeah, they go every day. We got to go every day. And it's, it's really incredible to think about the relentlessness of their job mm-hmm. because we all work, you know, our jobs are different, but we all work on a schedule right. and their schedules are relentless. And it's never like they're going into a, an easy day of work, yeah. especially now. And I, I can't help but respect them more and more for what they do. Well, and you know, just to follow up on that thought, you've seen the visuals, we've all seen them posted on social media of the thousands of nurses because of the PPE equipment that they have to wear, you know, and the scarring and the bruising and all of that. I mean, that for me is the poster of COVID-19, you know, just the fearlessness uh, and the sacrifice that all these people continue to, to make. So we're acknowledging International Nurse Appreciation Day as we record the Rain Dregs podcast here on uh, Wednesday. Mother's Day on Sunday, Ray, and uh, obviously, we, we begin with acknowledging uh, the mothers around the world who are listening to Ray and Greg's and uh, show our appreciation. Big thank you to all the moms. We don't often get to do this in person because you and I normally are overseas and we're covering the, the World Hockey Championship. So I know I've got something very special planned for Mother's Day and you are now on the clock. See how it works out. Well, I'm happy that you have something planned. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, Cammy and I've been married 15 years now and, you know, Riley's 13. So I think I'll probably go with the same formula that I've used for the <laughs> previous 13, which is I'm going to consider myself in Europe. Right. And I will get her flowers. <laughs> well, after all, I mean, Cammy isn't your mother. I mean, you can, you can coach your sons to, to do what's right, but they're old enough now where they've got to embrace this thing. Unless there's a skin <laughs> that Riley can earn in Fortnite, I don't think he will have <laughs> any image that Sunday is Mother's Day. <laughs> I suspect in camp we will get breakfast in bed. Um, we'll have that planned out. We'll yeah. probably have some flowers. <sighs> I, I can't think that. Yeah. What else can you do? Well, can you do us all a favor? And recreate those bunny rabbit pancakes for Cammy this Sunday. That'd be awesome. No, that was for that was for the kids for okay. Easter. They loved the bunny ear pancakes. Well, can you, you can make you can make a more adult version of the pancakes if you choose. That's up to you. Well, then could you do me a favor? Could you have a video of yourself sitting on your ass making ribs <laughs> in your in your smoker? And you could just have it like a time lapse of you sitting there for seven hours. Well. It's funny you say that because, uh, and, and hey, my smoker fans are going to, uh, they're going to be sour to hear this, but I've effectively been suspended from smoking for the foreseeable future because uh, I think I've pretty much choked out my family with the variety of meats that I've <laughs> relentlessly smoked over the past several weeks. So we're on a, a meat smoking hiatus, at least temporarily. Well, you could sit on your ass for seven hours, I'm sure, Holly. Yes. Assume that's a pretty good gift. 100%. Uh, good looking podcast coming up. We've got Oren Koulis, uh, who I don't know if he's the mastermind, but obviously a uh, key contributor to the Saw movie series. It's actually an empire. Um, yeah. Oren will talk to us about that. I, I, I know that uh, the ninth Saw movie was expected to be released later this month. And for obvious reasons, they've had to postpone that to 2021. Uh, but from a hockey perspective, was a pretty decent player back in his day, right, in the Western yep. Hockey League. Son Miles plays in the American Hockey League with uh, with Bakersfield. 
and he's a former owner, NHL owner of the Tampa Bay Lightning. So I'm looking forward to having a fun conversation there. We've got Ask Brain Dregs Anything. That's become a popular segment. And we've got breaking news here in episode 30, Ray. Uh, we do? And, yeah, we do. And, well, it was breaking to me until about 10 minutes ago when I realized that this was, in fact, happening. We now have the Ray and Dregs YouTube channel yes. where, yeah, where you can watch full episodes of the podcast, starting with episode 29, which is Jerome McGinley. That should be up there now, so you can check it out, and you can subscribe. And then, obviously, we'll we'll post all of these things, which is why we're now doing these things with you having your hair combed, and you look presentable, at least from the waist up. You look presentable. Well, yeah, I still, I still got my pajamas on, but, but Drake, you've got to use product. Just think. Yeah. Hopefully, I live another 30 years. I will not spend $1 on hair product again. <clears throat> Just think of the savings for my family because of the luscious locks that I could be <laughs> grooming. <laughs> um, so by product, you mean gel, any of that, not shampoo? Of or do you, are you one of those old school guys that just takes the, the, the bar of soap and just does one of these and you're done? No, I don't know what I'm going to do. I still got a half a bottle of shampoo left. <laughs> and so when that's out, I just can't imagine that I'm going to buy any more. What for? No, fair enough. <laughs> so let's get to a little bit more serious stuff here. We always like to tackle a couple of issues to kick off the, the podcast. And I, I don't know if it's issue related, uh, but, and correct me if I'm wrong, early in the podcast season, you talked about uh, Montreal being your favorite city, right? Yeah. As an NHL player. And that's the Montreal Forum, the Bell Center. Um, and, and playing in a packed venue where the crowd just is so knowledgeable, they get the sport, um, they're cheering, they're booing, and you can appreciate why. So again, I, I often like your perspective as a player, um, because we it feels like we pretty much know at this point, don't we, that whenever the NHL returns, they're playing in empty venues. There won't yeah. be fans allowed inside, and best case scenario might be limited fans. Like if it's a 19,000 seat facility, Maybe you'll find a way to put 5,000 people in there. I don't know, but let's let's assume it's an empty venue. How different is that going to feel from a player standpoint? Well, you can tell yourself that you don't notice the noise, and lots of times when you're locked in, you don't. Like when you're on the ice, yeah. I don't I don't think you notice the the general noise so much as when there's a big hit or a close chance you can, even on the ice, you'll hear the the roar of the crowd or the groans or whatever. When you're on the bench, like I would notice it much more. Like, you know, the, the rises and falls of the crowd. And um, I, I suspect it'll be like a really intense training camp scrimmage. You know, there's like the puck will go in the net. There'll be no noise. Yeah. They'll, the goalie will make a great save. And all you're going to hear is the skates of the guys going around. Yeah. Um, it will, it will seem really, really different. It mm -hmm. is uh, even watching, um, you know, baseball with no fans, like you hear the crack of the bat, but usually you hear the crowd erupt, erupt or groan if it's a home run against the home team. And yeah. now when you see like the baseball in Korea, the ball leaves, up, there's nothing. Yeah. It's the so weird we thing. It is weird. And we talked about this in that big group Zoom TSN chat that we had with, with essentially all of the hockey department with James Duthie hosting. And and one of the topics that was discussed was the NHL considering pumping in, you know, some of the, the crowd noise. Now, <clears throat> that would be, you know, into the telecast, into the broadcast. So the viewer at home, you know, maybe gets an amplified listen into what is being said as long as it's family listening. Um, but it would would it be weird from a player standpoint if they turned up the speakers inside the building? So maybe you're not hearing the chirping and all of that, but you're hearing that puck go off the bar, or you're hearing it go off the glass or off the boards. Because otherwise, it would be it'd be real quiet in there. I mean, you're going to hear absolutely everything. Well, so if you say they turn up the volume, um, you know, like you, you're going to hear the the puck hit the bar more cleanly than you would if there's people anyway. In there. Right. Right. You're going to hear that yeah. anyway. The There's just going to be a lack of energy drags. 
yeah. in the building. And, it, and it, I think they can pump in whatever they want and try to do it the best they can. I just don't, I don't see there's any way to recreate it or to, or to make it seem yeah. there's people in there. Now, you know, a, a, a crowd of, you know, a selected crowd, if you will, like a, Hey, it's a 19,000 seat building. We can put 7,500 people in here, you know, spaced out safely. Like that would be better. I think so. Like it would, I think it would, as I think of it, Drake's, I think it would be better by a long shot. I, I guess my it's trouble. Do it. Yeah. I, my trouble with it is, you know, anytime you and I, or, or anyone, anyway, when you, when you go to a game, I mean, we go to, a bazillion games yeah. um, in a different capacity, obviously. But when you're going there to watch, let's say you're, you're, you're in Europe or as you used to in the NHL and the American League and the Western League watching Landon play. I mean, you're going there with somebody. You know, that's, you know, where you and Cammy are sitting side by side or, you know, uh, a brother, a buddy, any of those things. What's the experience going to be like if you have to sit six, eight feet away from everyone including those people in front of you behind you beside you <laughs> I mean, it's it's it... uh, i never thought of it that way i okay so <laughs> say so i'm living in the house with cammy you mean that i can't sit beside her i i and, assume you could yeah no but the answer is i don't know and i don't know how they would execute it because you yeah. can have lots of great ideas right like the yeah. league could have all these awesome ideas You've got to be able to execute it. Yeah. And and that would be, it would be strange. Like I, I do say, <laughs> as you say about, you know, not sitting right next to somebody, <laughs> you hear a lot of nonsense in the crowd. Maybe I'd like that. I don't know. <laughs> well, two things come to mind here. Uh, and I want to get some thoughts on Leon Dreisaitl, who I had in Dreger Cafe this week. Um, okay. Are they going to allow the Columbus Blue Jackets to fire off that cannon? <laughs> in an empty venue that oh, would be awful no you have to now <laughs> the players will absolutely jump right off the bench now do you remember in chicago stadium the the old stadium they used to have that horn i guess they have the similar yeah. horn but it was in that little building yeah and so my first game there i think we lost nine two it might have been eight two or something or other the first time that horn went off I just about jumped. It sounded like a truck coming through the <laughs> side of the building. I just about jumped off the bench. By the time the thing went off the seventh time, you're like, ah, whatever. Yeah, just whatever. Enough. But that that cannon, oh yeah, they got to fire it in there. The cannon, the siren in Carolina. I mean, there's so many of those things that'll be fun. Um, all right, Leon Dreisaitl, uh happened to be the first visitor to the home edition of the Dreger Cafe. Ray, he he talked about studying the play of, of Pavel Datsuk and watching as many games as he can get his hands on through YouTube and various means. Um, not much not to like about Leon Dreisaitl, but I got to tell you, as he's explaining this to me, it makes me appreciate and like Leon Dreisaitl that much more because he's an all world type of talent. We can see that on a game in and game out basis yet, man, he just continues to work at his craft and, I guess you pretty much have to, to be a star in today's NHL. When Leon got drafted by the Prince Albert Raiders of the Western Hockey League, um, the head coach and general manager was a guy by the name of Bruno Campessi. And uh, Bruno's from Nelson, uh, BC. I'm from Trail, BC. It's about 30 kilo or 50 kilometers apart. I played against Bruno my, you know, my whole life, basically. Mm -hmm. And we played together in Portland in the Western Hockey League. Um, the only reason that's relevant is that when the first year I was doing the world juniors that Leon was going to be in, I called Bruno and I said, Hey, we got this, this German kid, this dry sidle. He's, you know, your star. Tell me about him. And he, he painted a picture Drake's of an incredibly hardworking kid that came from Germany sight unseen into Prince Albert had to learn English on a, conversational level you know he knew words and stuff but he had to learn it he had when they used to have a practice after practice they called it it was basically skill sessions mm -hmm. bruno talked about how leon would just drive himself to be the very best not just to be the best guy on the team he wanted to be the very best now when you brought up pavel datsuk when 
When I retired and became a broadcaster, my favorite player to watch by far, bar none, was Pavel Datsuk. And I always have to check myself when he was playing that I wasn't the the head of the Pavel Datsuk fan club while I was broadcasting. That I <laughs> loved the way the guy played, loved everything about him. And when you bring up Datsuk uh, as a as an um, a goal of Drysital to learn and watch from. I can see Drysidle in some of the things that Datsuk did. Now, Datsuk never went fast. All right. He didn't run all over the place because it's wasted effort. And Drysidle doesn't ever race himself all over the ice. What I see in the similarity is how Datsuk would come up behind a player from behind and he'd be patient till he could lift the stick and steal the puck. Make a picture. You can see Drysidle doing that. Yeah. He'll do that all the time in Edmonton. I see Drysidel stay out of the play and then jump into the play. That's what Datsuk used to do. Like it's a it's a tremendous image to make from one player to the other. Now they're not the same, of course, but I can see why Drysidel's game would make him want to watch Datsuk. Yeah, and and credit to Leon Drysidel. I mean, every player uh, in the NHL wants to get better. Willing, most of them willing to work at it to get better, but. He acknowledged in the interview, too, that the defensive side is something that he knows that he needs to work on and is, is very focused on improving. He's a likable guy. You know, he's, a, he's an interesting character. Uh, hockey aside, we had lots of fun, so it was nice to catch up with Leon. Remember when he came over to the World Championships and we were yeah. in Col- It was like the king was coming back. Yeah. Front page of the paper. They had him walking down the street, and, man, that <laughs> building was jumping for his return. Well, I mean, he's such a fixture now of, of what's coming out of German hockey. And we talked a little bit about Tim Stutzel, who, uh, you know, he could be a top three pick. Dreisaitl was drafted third overall by the Edmonton Oilers, of course. So uh, he doesn't know a whole lot about Tim Stutzel. He admitted he hasn't met him yet. But, man, is he excited to uh, to see how this young man well, first, where he gets drafted, and then to uh, watch his career uh, take off. So we're going to move forward here, Ray. Um, by the way, if you're interested in partnering with Ray and I on the podcast, you can hit our website, rayandregs.com, and fill out the sponsorship information there. Our interview with Oren Kulis today is uh, coming up next, and it's brought to you by our friends at CoolBet.co, the free-to-play sports and casino games website. Hey, no sports? No problem. Enjoy trying all of the biggest, the best casino games like bat, a blackjack, roulette, poker, slots, whatever you want, they've got it. And they're all free to play at coolbet.co. You have to be 19. And Coolbet reminds you, stay cool and always bet responsibly. Orn, uh, look, I checked out your Wikipedia page, which oh, no. is uh, always entertaining to me. Uh, I've got multiple cousins, by the way, around the National Hockey League, if you haven't heard. It describes you as an entrepreneur, a film producer, pro sports executive, amateur barbecuer, uh, average beer league hockey player. So which one of those best describes the life that you're living right now? Barbecue. Okay, good. By a mile. And what's your go-to? Uh, my go-to's uh, ribs. Actually, if I'm in Toronto, just the reheat. Uh, what is oh the market? Whatever that one market, Summer Summer Hill, whatever that market. Yeah, is, uh, yeah. reheat ribs in the world. Uh, <laughs> ribs are uh, you know ribs are beef or steak. Well, best known for the nine Saw movies, obviously, uh, or maybe not. Two and a Half Men was a pretty big series uh, globally, I would say. So which do you prefer to talk about and the follow-up is can you text charlie sheen today and expect a response from him within an hour or a week uh a couple things first it used to really bother me because i've always somehow and I, I guess it's just riding way too many buses in the west but i always it bothered me when they would say hollywood guy when i was involved with tampa because i always consider myself a hockey person and i would never I, to me hollywood was amazing and it still is but it's it's uh <laughs> I don't know. It's it's great, but it's 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 I you know I'd rather go watch a hockey game than a movie. And uh, yeah, I can get Charlie in about ten minutes if we needed to. <laughs> sure. 
how did you how did you end up in the movies? Truthfully, girls. Oh, I was yeah. trained, I was so it, it's the longest story. The, the quickest story is, is I lived in Chicago and back in the in the seventies and eighties. Commodity traders, the, the open markets where the guys yelled and screamed. Um, I, I someone got me Al Secord's girlfriend at the time's <laughs> dad got me a job as a runner on the floor, and I did it for a few years every summer. Worked my way up, and then the last year I got sent down to the coast. And I'm like, I was really close to becoming a trader. And I thought, this is insane. And I left and went back to the floor and worked my way up. And by the January, I got uh, a seat on the exchange. And so I started hanging wow. out and doing what it and started chasing girls and realized half the time you meet a girl, she was cute. She was lived in L.A. And I thought, I'm going to give this a shot. OK, so you're, you're chasing <laughs> a girl or several no, girls. Just, there, there was no girl. It was just. <laughs> right right so how do you go from there to a movie not just a movie but a franchise um we i mean i'd done a bunch of you know not a bunch but i think 10 12 movies before saw so i had two and a half men going we had another tv series going and um what happened is is in in the movie business there's a the back end you get is awful and it just it's, it's there's so many layers and distribution fees and so we made a movie called John Q with Denzel that did really well and we never saw a dime other wow. than our salary and it, so my partner looked at me one day and said we got to start owning stuff content's going to be the key let's put our own money up little million dollar movies let's do one or two a year and in ten years we'll have fifteen twenty movies and we'll sell that and that'll be our 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 exit and the first one turned out to be saw so we got a script. It was a, a, a university project by these two college kids from Australia. We they designed it to do, do it for like forty thousand. They opened it up. We did it, and here I am. Okay, so so these kids, right? I'm like I have no concept of any of this. So they come to you with a script, right? And yep. what do you know about a a horror movie? Like, how do you know we, it's good well, or? We didn't, you know what, and this is, and it's, it, we didn't make it as a horror film. We thought we were making Seven. Remember the Brad Pitt movie? Yeah. yeah, yeah we yeah. thought we were making a thriller and we made it and we did exactly what we thought. And a guy named Tim Palin at Lionsgate was so smart. He came to us and said, thrillers are good if you have, you know, Morgan Freeman and Gwyneth Paltrow and Kevin Spacey and Brad Pitt. We didn't have those actors. And he said, I think the horrors in flux. We're going to make this the new horror. And Tim Palin absolutely gets the credit for i mean the filmmakers made a great film we're all proud of everything but tim palin decided to label this horror went after the horror crowd and helped a ton what's harder uh, what's a harder project a movie or a tv show i think tv i think i mean because a movie is it's it's a confined time there's beginning a middle and an end in you know, on the tv it's it's you have to basically tell them a whole year of stories at this point. Even you know, listen, if you're David Kelly, who you guys, I don't know if you guys know yeah. David. Yeah. Um, it's Mark. It's actually Mark Kelly from Chicago's uh, brother, but David's doing a show. He is such a name that he could probably give them six or eight ideas and they believe in him. But for most people, it's, it's hard to sell a TV show and it's really hard to execute. So once you start, you've got to have faith that it can go from year to like, if they say we want to renew, you can't be in a scramble to holy hell. No, they, they, you literally show them an, a board with an arc of like 16 stories, 18 stories you're going to have every year. And then what's going to happen? That character's going to die. That character's it, it's if, if you're good at it. You're really good. A guy like Dick Wolf that has all the law and orders and now has the Chicago, whatever they are. I mean, he's incredible. David Kelly's a genius. It's, it's a real, real skill set. So if you're at the top, you know, as you own the show, how is that similar to owning a hockey team that you no you have the to trust is, the guys, <laughs> or do you no, get more involved? Is, is, is someone like I was really lucky enough to work, um, I guess, for in a weird way, but with Chuck Laurie, who is Big Bang, Two and a Half Men, and he, he is so smart. He did he didn't delegate well, and that's why he's. But I mean, it's just a complete cash cow for him. I mean, there's money coming in on every show. And he, you don't, if you're like a guy like David Kelly, he oversees every part. He oversees what the girl looks like, oversees what somebody looks like in episode 10 that he had in mind and everything from there down. Hockey's not like that. No. <laughs> no. Okay. So how do you get into the Tampa Bay Lightning? 
Joey Scaleri. <laughs> Joey came to me and said, Doug McClain is looking for some money. And it was a small amount of money, him and some guy from Florida, who I'm not even going to name. And they, uh, they have all the money raised. They need a little bit of money, and they're going to buy the Tampa Bay Lightning. Some or another, about two months later, they were out. They were trying to sue me because I didn't put the money up, but I'm the only one that put the money up. And then so Gary got rid of them and I ended up with money in and kept going. Wow. So, I, I mean, you enjoyed your time as an owner in the National Hockey League, correct? I mean, there were moments I, where it wasn't great, but you enjoyed it overall. I absolutely loved it. My, you know, I mean, listen, I'm not making economy, but I mean, if anyone looks at our world, I mean, now with everything falling apart, they always talk about, they compare it to 08. And yeah. Florida was probably the hardest hit state. So owning any business, if you owned taco stands, if you owned car washes, 08, 9, 10 in Florida was a losing bet, even no matter if we did a perfect job or we did a horrible job that really, you know, I would do every once in a while, we'd have like 20 or 30 old season ticket holders that didn't renew, come in for a quick dinner, quick bite, beautiful dinner. And I got to talk for a few minutes and somebody might not like me. They might not like Vinny. They might not like talk, but it was 95%. Hey, we managed 20 condos. We had our little business. All 20 condos are gone. And as soon as our business gets up, we can't wait to be season ticket holders again. And you can't fight that. It, no. It's nothing to do with what place your team's in. You sold the team in 2010, your, your majority share. Um, you didn't want to sell, though, did you, at, at that point? No, and I, well, because I, I listen, I, I loved it. And I knew that it, it, we had a good, I mean, listen, we had Marty, who was a great leader. We, got, we drafted what I feel, anyways, two Hall of Fame players and Stammer and uh, Hedman. And I mean, I think I saw a poll this year, Hedman. I think that the players again thought he was the best defense in the league. Mm -hmm. Stammer's, you know, he's he's incredible. And so I, 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 Brian Lawton was doing an incredible job of getting rid of all the mess and believing in a long term in adding pieces. So I, I didn't want to sell, but like guys like Stammer and Hedman, and was like, wait, why? You know, in in there was a lot of pieces there to start building up. Would you ever want to get back? I don't know. You know what? I, the pro, I, I've talked to Gary about it a few times. I might. Um, Matt Holsizer from Chicago and I had the deal to buy St. Louis years and years ago. And then Gary came to us and said, a hundred percent rightly. So I have a local group, which is Mr. Stillman and like, he's very connected politically, business wise in St. Louis. And he had like, 20 local guys. I'm going to make up the number wrong, but it was the absolute right thing. Gary said, I think I should go with them and walked us through his process. And Matt and I completely agreed. And Gary was hundred percent right. They've done a great job down there and they've, you know, they won a cup and, but they've done a great job on top of winning the cup. When, when you watch the game today, um, what do you focus on? Do you focus on the play? Do you, are you more focused on the business side and the, how they put the teams together? What drives you? Just the skill. Just the skill, right? Look at stuff and go, holy shit, I never would have tried that. <laughs> no right? Even Ray, Ray, you're what is, Ray, you're I'm gonna have eight million goals and there's <laughs> there's guys doing stuff that they, you wouldn't even think, like you never even tried it in practice. Like, how about when you watch your son Miles skate and do things, you're like, we couldn't do what they do, and then you you go and look at like a, you know, a a, a top of the, you know, a Crosby or an Ovechkin and what they can do. So even the whole chain of players from our sons who have played against each other to yep. the top of the, the war, it's like, it's amazing to watch. So you like that? I love watching or, that, but what gets me, it's, it's not the Ovechkin because there's always generational players. What gets me is an average. And I don't want to say somebody's average, but a good second line forward, yeah. third line forward that can do things you wouldn't dream of. That pulls the puck through his legs back or, you know, Picking the puck, all this picking the puck up. There's just certain things. I remember Mark Habscheid when he was in Saskatoon. I played against him, and he pulled it through his legs. I'd never seen anybody pull through the legs. Before. <laughs> yeah. And you I remember Habby? You know, <laughs> Habby used to wear the Gretzky helmet. Right? Yeah, the Jofa helmet. Yeah, and everybody was like, "Who the hell does this guy think he is?" <laughs> but he was the first guy I ever saw pull a puck through the legs, and it was not even something that you conceived. Like you never thought about doing it, and like picking the puck up and like the lacrosse goals and all of that. I, I, it, it, there's there's certain things kids try now. I think it's great. I think it's great for the game. I love the individualism, but I can't. And I'm not going to be the old school. But Ray, you played in the West after me. Can you imagine somebody doing a lacrosse goal in the West? Dude, we still be fighting. Yes. 
I played for Patty Janelle. So he, you, you know, I mean, okay. Were you on the teams that used to take the other guys nets and warm up? I was on a team in medicine where we weren't allowed to warm up with the other team. We had to have separate warm ups our second <laughs> half of the year. <laughs> Just think we had so, a guy, so, that was a good idea at the time, right? <laughs> yeah, no, we, we used to have to warm up. I'm not kidding you separately. We weren't even allowed the ice. We had a morning skate against Brandon once. And they had Boris Fistrick and a bunch of uh, big no. guys. And they, I think he was in they were Regina. I think it was Brandon. And they came on the ice in street clothes in our warm up, our morning <laughs> skate. I'm not kidding you. My hand. <laughs> what was I the one you friends, were in? Or in worst I tell my friends in Chicago these stories. They didn't believe me. No. Sorry. What, what was the worst brawl you were in? You had to have a couple uh, there. Monty Trache broke my nose, and there was like a we had a lot less guys than they did. We we're on the road playing in Billings, and uh, you know, I, there's nothing you could do. You just keep going. And he, he, I, I he hit me, and, you know, he just hit me. We were in a regular fight, but it was 20 on 20, and there was goalies jumping in, and it just kept going. It wasn't like you, you couldn't go down because nobody was going to help. There was no refs on the ice. <laughs> Could you right. imagine saying to your son now, hey, this is a great league. Don't worry about the five bench clears a year. It'll be fine for you. They, I mean, listen, I'm not being old time, but it, it, listen, the hockey's great. It's been, I think the sport is, is doing better and better. You know, some of the rule, like the nitpick rules, like offside, like from two minutes previous, I don't like. Yeah. But, um, you know, I think it's doing great. I think the skill's amazing for the game. I really do. I think it's more and more fun to watch. Mm -hmm. Was it, you know, was it fun to be part of, you know, more of an eye for an eye stuff. Yeah. And they still take guys still take care of each other. And I, I appreciate, you know, I would like watching that. And I think the stuff like the Dowdy to Chuck stuff's kind of fun to watch and listen to them. You know, I don't think there's enough of that. I don't mean that stuff, but I mean, even just the talking. All right. Well, let, let's, let's, we've talked about Landon on the podcast before, Ray, but I don't know if we've ever asked you to describe yourself as a hockey dad. So now we've got two of you, Miles, Coolest plays for the Bakersfield Condors, uh, clearly trying to make his way to the National Hockey League and, and the Edmonton Oilers. So, Oren, I'll start with you, but, Ray, I want you to chime in on this. Describe yourself as a pro hockey father. Oh, I, I you know, I also, it's, it's interesting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to only sidetrack this for a second because I feel like yeah. Ray and I kind of a parallel because I remember texting Ray once, and we're not great friends, but I texted him once, and he was literally in carpool or doing something, and I've been remarried for almost 15 years and have an 8-year-old and 11-year-old and then a 26-year-old. So I kind of feel like Ray and I have kind of going yeah. through the second journey together. Um, anyway, it, 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 it's hard. You know what I mean? It, it's hard to watch, and you, you know, it's just, I don't know. I'd rather play than watch. <laughs> All I, right. for myself, I watch it watch every game that I can when Landon yep. was playing in Berlin this year in the German league so I'm up at you know at six in the morning watching and then every Sunday they'd play these afternoon games at two so which is 4 30 in the morning and I'm up lying on the couch because I just love it I love to watch them play but when I'm in the rink or and I don't know if you're like this I don't want to stand with anybody else. I don't want oh, to, no, I go to the, I go in the corner where they shoot by myself. My wife won't even go with me. Or if she goes, she'll bring one of our daughters and sit with the kids. And I go sit by myself in a corner where they're shooting all three yeah. periods. And I like, you know, and I'll run into a, a scout or they always stay high or something, but I, you know, or an agent. And I just kind of say hi and keep going. <laughs> okay. Now when miles turns the puck over, <laughs> Right. You, mm -hmm. you all, you notice right away. Do you notice everybody else turning it over or just, no, no, <laughs> like, no, of course not. I, I, I only watch him. So if I, you know, you see, you watch any player other than, you know, they're all in the American league or so they're there for a reason, you know, none of, so I guess what I'm saying is this, if you watch any player that closely, you're going to see mistakes you could watch Gretz and see a mistake he made them defensively or lost a face off or something. Right. So no, I exactly. You know, I've, I've had guys that. ask me after a game, how do you think so-and-so played? I have no idea. I'm oh, watching one player. <laughs> I, seriously, so I'll go see somebody and someone, I literally have a text from somebody once in a while. I'll say, Hey, do me a favor. You're, you're watching miles play San Jose watch X. And I'm, I'm like, I didn't even know he played. <laughs> 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 but there's nothing better, is it? No, we have. It's been fun. I really liked it in Bakersfield this year. He didn't have the best year, but it was fun because he left home in eighth grade and went to Shattuck. And to have him be a hundred miles away, so he had yeah. a Saturday night game, 
And depending on their schedule, they might even have Monday off. He's home by midnight on Saturday night, Sunday brunch with the kids, hanging out, you know, and either go back Sunday night or Monday. No, he what's he doing to, do to stay in shape or can he, or what yeah, is he's, he? He's not skating, but he's, he's, he's doing his usual. Uh, we have a gym at the house and yeah. um, he also loves basketball. And so he, we have basketball here. So he plays a ton of hoops. Do you, uh, do you get that? Go ahead and pray. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I was saying, can you beat him at anything anymore? Or is that all gone? No, no, no. <laughs> no I'm, I'm with you. It's all finished. They shoot. You know what? The way they shoot with, and I'm not trying to be old again, but the way they shoot with the sticks and they lean on them and they just, they just go. And you're like, Whoa, we, we had, want to be we, had a, now. we had a family, um, kind of a little Olympics. You had to shoot some basketball on the court from certain places. And then you had to shoot pucks into the targets. And I finished last in the targets and <laughs> yeah. the kids were all, even the little guys beat me. Oh. Yeah, no, I, I'd be there. I, oh, I, they were my all daughters there. played hockey. They beat me. How about Cammie? Where did Cammie finish in that run? Uh, she finished second right behind Landon. Well, mm -hmm. By the way, it's funny because you, 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 you do know how long I've known the Granados, right? No, I don't. I grew up, Tony was a year younger than me. I, I played the Elmhurst Huskies with Tony. Donnie coached, Donnie at the national program coached Miles, but I've known Tony since I was seven or eight years old. I went to see Miles when Donnie was coaching and Mr. and Mrs. Granado came down and were hugging me and they came down to, it, we, Miles played with the national team in Dubuque uh, against Dubuque. Yeah. And they came, they drove down to see Donnie coach and we hung out for like an hour just talking awesome. stories about have you i grew up in lagrange which is just up from downers grove like 10 minutes sure now so I've, known, I've known mr Mitt, i've known them since i literally probably 50 years longer wow. oh that is crazy i didn't know that yeah. now was tony as vicious a player as an eight-year-old as he turned out to be no, not at all not at all no seriously he, 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 ser seriously but i don't know what happened at wisconsin because chelly was a third line right wing and she, nobody knows this chelly quit hockey how many guys do you know that are in the Hall of Fame that did not play hockey as a 15-year-old? Wow. He quit, quit hockey. His, his family moved to say the true story, because Charlie will tell a good story with anybody. He left Chicago, 15 years old, didn't play hockey, played some pickup hockey in San Diego. Somebody knew somebody, knew somebody when he was playing pickup hockey in Moose Jaw, went there as a forward, and they said, we don't have it. And so he started playing defense. When I play against Regina, he'd always come stay high and sit with me in the stands and we talk in, in like, and all of a sudden he grew like a foot. Like if you ever see the rest of Chelly's family, they're all five, six. <laughs> and, but he became mean. Chelly was a third line right wing in Bantam. Seriously. Wow. Not even exaggerating one bit. I played Bantam with Chelly. <laughs> that is crazy. No, I didn't know that at all. And he went, yeah. I mean, and then he went, he went, Moose Jaw was tier two then. All right. And he went to Moose Jaw. And was playing there as, a, as a, they didn't have room, so he started playing defense. And he was always good with a puck, but he was tiny, and he grew. And but then he went to Wisconsin, and became crazy. So I don't know, <laughs> college hockey. You think of like nice guys, and Tony and him were the nicest two guys that didn't weren't afraid to swing a stick once they left college hockey. <laughs> there you go, Ray. You've got a little bit of fodder now for the next uh, Gr uh, Granado family event. But I never yeah. Cammy because she was younger, and I left. You know what I mean? So I didn't know. I met Donnie once or twice. He said when, like, in the summer skates. I don't really remember. I knew Tony because mm -hmm. he played up and I played up. But yeah. that was, you know, that was uh, literally 50 wow. years ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I, I was the what I was about to. <laughs> yeah, no, but it was a highlight, honestly, to, to run into to mom and dad at uh, in Dubuque about mm. 10 years ago. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, what's what's the next big project for you, Orn? Well, what are you we working just, on? We, well, we did Saw 9, which is called Spiral, which we had Chris Rock and Sam Jackson. The movie was supposed to come out next week, and we pushed it to May of 21. Which okay. So it's, it's it's fun. You know, people don't think of a Saw movie with, with Sam Jackson and Chris Rock. Um, it's And I'm not just saying, because I've made a lot of mistakes. It's a really good movie. It really is. And I'm not a hype guy at all. And so it's, it's, it's coming so out. You started. It's May, of, May 21 of 21 now. Okay. Because the guys are just afraid of the fall. They're not sure, yeah. they're not sure what theaters. Mm -hmm. And so we just basically, we were supposed to come May 15th. So next week, we're yeah. supposed to come out in the world. And so we pushed it a year. So you started with unknown actors way, way, way back in, in the first one. 
Um, yeah, it, I mean, well, Terry Elwes was, wasn't unknown. We got, I mean, Danny Glover was in the movie for a small, but I mean, not unknown, but but not, not like this. No, and you know what? Chris Rock came to us. It was really cool. Chris Rock, and I've known Chris socially a little bit. And I said, Chris wants to see you, and so my partner and I took a meeting with him, and I thought he was going to try to talk to me about a comedy or something. And I'm kind of uneasy, and we're saying, how's you, you know, marriage? We're talking about divorce. He's been divorced. He's got like the greatest riff on divorce in history. <laughs> yes. And yeah. we're talking, and you know, he's obviously really funny. And then I said, okay, so what's up with, what do you want, you know, what do you want to do a song? And he said, and I was really hesitant because I didn't want to say no. And he said, did you ever see the movie 48 Hours with Eddie Murphy? And I said, yeah, it's one of my favorite movies. He goes, I want to be a slightly funny guy in a really serious movie. Because 48 Hours, they were shooting people and killing people. It was a serious mm -hmm. movie. And Eddie was funny. And literally a light bulb went on. I said, I'm in. <laughs> and that's, that's literally, so we've made a, movie with chris rock and sam jackson plays his father that's a very serious movie but it's it's chris has a couple funny bits inside well if you want an intense sometimes angry former nhl player yep ray ferraro is your man <laughs> <laughs> i'd be good i'd be good at getting killed i think <laughs> yeah, exactly I've had more people come to me over the years and say, can I please die in one of your movies? <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple of people I want to put in those scenes, but no, I haven't, uh, I haven't ever done it. All right, Orrin. Well, uh, we appreciate you taking the time to join us. Uh, best to your family. Uh, you stay safe and we'll connect in the future. Thank you. Exactly. Ray, say hi to the, uh, say hi to the extended family for me. I will for sure, Orrin. Thanks say for your time. Landon. I, I, Miles knew I was doing this. He said to give, give Landon a tap. Yeah, hate a, hate a Miles, too. Well, Ray, uh, another entertaining guest here on the Ray and Dregs Hockey Podcast. Uh, Oren Coolis definitely fits into that category. And when, when you think of the bigger picture of this, right? I mean, so you're starring in the Western Hockey League um, and, and clearly on the path to do what you did and become a, an exceptional NHL player. But back in that day, Oren Coolis was a above average Western Hockey League talent offensively he was he could not have pictured in his mind back then that he was going to get into the movies he was going to help develop uh, a crushing entertaining tv series in two and a half men and also be the majority owner of an NHL team the, the Tampa Bay Lightning talk about a life that he's led and enjoyed I'm sure every second of it the the thing that strikes me is like how little of it could have been planned. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like the, he was playing hockey. So he probably thought he was going to be a hockey player. When I was five years old, I thought I was going to be an NHL player. Cause I didn't know any different. I was just a little kid, but then I didn't do anything different drags. I played hockey my whole life. I retired and now I broadcast. So he's playing hockey and then he's almost a commodities trader. And then, <laughs> Because he noticed there's a bunch of beautiful women are going to Hollywood. He's like, well, I'm going to go to Hollywood. And then he ends up in the movie business. Unreal. And so there's probably all kinds of people that want to be in the movie business that try to develop a little program and or a, a movie, a TV show, something. And the first movie they decide to produce on their own is Saw. Yeah, like, it's not like it was a dud, and then they had to go scramble for money. They they hit with the first thing, and then that leads them back to his first love, which is hockey, yeah. where he can purchase Tampa Bay. I mean, like, what a crazy timeline to draw out. There's a great saying: um, plans are something that are made while life is happening. And so he's making all these plans, and then all of a sudden, life took him 14 directions. I, <laughs> I, I think it's an amazing story. Yeah, and he talked a little bit about it in the podcast, um, you know, how close he came to uh, getting back in, buying the St. Louis Blues. And, uh, I mean, he certainly didn't commit to wanting to jump back into NHL ownership anytime soon. But, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised, would you? I mean, he's got a great relationship, it sounds like, with the commissioner. And it doesn't sound like money's a problem, so who knows? Uh, he didn't say no. Yeah. Like he didn't jump right away and go, no, I'm not interested anymore. That's past, you know, like he's, he's young enough. He's what, 59 years old. So, yeah. um, oh, I, I think it kind of struck me, Drake's yeah. just even the way he asked that if the right thing came along, he's not uninterested. 
No, fair enough. And thanks, Doran Coolis, for joining us on the podcast. Every week on the podcast, we ask you to send your questions uh, via email or to rayandregs.com or on Instagram. Uh, you can find us at Ray and Riggs, and we'll answer as many as we can here on the podcast on a weekly basis. We call it Ask Ray uh, and Riggs Anything. Question one, Ray, comes from James. And James says, assuming the NHL will be back in the summer, and I think we all assume that, but maybe unfair to assume that, do we think that it's going to be harder for goaltenders to get their game back or skaters? And Jamie McLennan talked about this on the podcast a few weeks back. He says, I think goalies, since they might take a while to get their heads back into that unique mental state and the instinctual part of the game are what they're going to have to get on top of and might struggle with. Do you agree with James? Um, I, I think it's harder for a goalie to get his timing back on the bang-bang plays that will happen. Um, one thing goalies always talk about is that the um, – the it's one thing to face a shot in practice where it's a predictable shot from a, you know, it's a drill. It's a predictable shot from a predictable place. And in the game, of course, that's just, that just doesn't happen. Uh, I, I think it would be harder for the right. goalies um, to, to kind of square up their game. All right. From Nicholas, this is for you, Ray. During the off season, how long of a break did you normally take? from skating each summer and how long did it take you to get your skating back to 100% game shape um, whenever you resume? And the point is from Nicholas, he's wondering how real difficult it's going to be for guys who haven't been able to skate since this pause. And, and, and probably generationally speaking, this will be the first time that these players aside from injury, haven't been able to skate for two or three months. So how long did it take you to get back into game shape and how tough is this going to be? Um, to get back into game shape, I'd say week by week, you would get better. I'd start right after the August long weekend. And so that would give me about a month till camp. I probably could have squeezed that up if, you know, if we were under time restraint or something, uh, like these guys will be, um, I would say within, within two to three weeks, they should be in pretty decent position to play. All right, Ray, question from Arden in Seattle. And you may have some inside information on this. So just uh, go accordingly, whether you can answer or not. Arden says, I get they can't name the NHL Seattle team until things are back to normal. What do we think is the best name out of what's been speculated? The Kraken, the Totems, the Metropolitans, the Rainiers, the Emeralds, the Sockeyes, the Whales the Sea Lions, the Eagles, uh, any others? And, and Arden has fingers crossed for the Sockeyes. Any inside information on this, given Cammy's connection to Seattle? It, okay, if if Cammy knows, yeah, he hasn't told me. And wow. I will tell you, the Granados should work for the CIA. <laughs> because there was a time, I'll get back to this answer, there was a time, I'm sitting in a, Cammie and I were in a hotel somewhere. We're on a little vacation. John Butchergrass sends me a text and he says, hey, I hear Tony is going to coach the University of Wisconsin. Cammie's brother, Tony. And I said, I sent him a note back. I go, I got no idea. So I yelled to where Cammie was kind of lounging and, you know, I'm with the kids and I go, hey, is Tony going to coach at Wisconsin? <laughs> he came up with this terrible lie. I'm like, are you kidding me? And she's like, well, I wasn't supposed to say anything. And so in that time, Bucci texts back and said, I hear Donnie's going too. Their other brother. And I said, is Donnie going too? I go, what is wrong with you people? <laughs> so Cammy knew for a week and never told me anything. So <laughs> if she knows the name, I got no idea. My two preferences. If I were to pick in order, would be the totems and the kraken. Okay. Um, um, do you know what a kraken it's is? It's a sea monster Myth thing. Yeah, a mythical sea monster. See, good for you. I was surprised you knew that. I I think what you're saying there is you think I'm an idiot a little. No, bit. No, 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 no. So here's the thing, Drake. The totems is a historical name. There's a connection to, um, yeah. you know, 
back to former professional hockey in Seattle. Um, I think there is a, a respectful connection to the, the native American population up and down the West coast, the first nation in Canada. Yeah. Um, uh, I think that could be done. I hope it can. Cause I think it would be fantastic. The crack and all I can think of is they would have the best mask on. <laughs> what was the movie? Um, and again, a mythical movie based on a mythical creature uh, where Zeus screams, release the Kraken. Oh, it was Liam Neeson was Zeus. Um, it was a, it was an animated movie. Uh, no, no, movie. no, yes, it no, it was not. No, it was not. So it was not an animated movie. <laughs> <laughs> it was well, it could have been another one release the kraken comes from the lego movie uh I, okay but in this particular movie um what's what what again what, what's the uh the angry lady with the snakes growing out of her head medusa <laughs> yeah so the, so this dude and his pals had to go into her lair cut her head off and that was the only way that you could kill the kraken was by holding the head up and the Kraken turned into stone and it wasn't an animated movie. We're both going to get absolutely hammered for this. Yes. Roasted. Um, what you described, <laughs> I've never seen what I described. You've <laughs> never seen. <laughs> well, at least we both know what the Kraken is. So we're, we're covered on that front. So what would you pick? Uh, I I'm, I'm okay with the totems. I like that because it embraces culture and the history of the area. So I, I'm probably more in favor of that, but I agree with you in the top two picks. I like the Kraken just because it's, you know, there's a mythical connection to it and you're right. You could have some fun with it. It, it reminds me a little bit of Vegas, right? When you, right. Go to a, you go to a game in Vegas, there's so much theater and ceremony happening before the game, during the intermissions, post game and all that. There's probably an opportunity there that Seattle can learn from. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think there's a, a real easy market or marketing to crack. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ricky gets our final question and ask Ray and Dregs anything uh, a bit more serious. No, a lot more serious. If the COVID-19 projections in the news turn out to be true in the United States, seeing thousands of deaths a day in June, July peak, uh, Ricky says, I don't know how any of the big four sports leagues can be getting back to playing at that time. So he's talking June, July. And he appreciates that sports is a, uh, is a distraction. We all want that. But what's wrong with waiting another month or two until things are back to normal or closer to normal to finish your current seasons and start the 2020-21 NHL and NBA seasons in January if necessary? So really what Ricky is talking about here is wiping out the remainder of 1920, starting 2021 in January. I, I don't know that I'm willing to go that far and wiping out this season. I don't think that you have to, but I know Ray, there's at least one team in the NHL that would like the pause to drift into August. So the players don't even think about coming back to training camp until August. You play whatever you can play in terms of a Stanley cup postseason, And then you start next year in December and, and that's workable. And that takes some of the stress off the players, their families, um, the health authorities and the provinces and the states to get this thing back running. You know, Dregs, the more this goes on and the more that we're reading and, you know, um, the numbers from the United States right now, the, the number of people dying per day and the number of people being infected is, it's hard to get your head around. Yeah. Um, if this didn't start till September and they went September, October to finish, <laughs> November and half of December off for a break. Yeah. And started mid December. I, that may be what they have to go to anyway, but I I'm becoming more comfortable with that Drake's. Yeah. Uh, to, we need as much breathing room as possible from the peaks of this disease. Now there, there are many that think a second wave is inevitable. Once we get back to a, a more normal way of life well why would we want to put ourselves as a sport in the middle of that the second wave is yeah. going to in 
in some theories, almost inevitably, why would we put ourselves into the middle of that? But if yeah. you can go backwards to September, October, maybe that helps that timeline out a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. All right. On lighter side, as we wrap up another edition of the podcast, um, you must have a game of golf planned. I'm so envious. When are you going up? I played last Friday, my first yeah. 18 holes. I uh, was even par for seven. I made uh, five straight double bogeys to quickly take me out of the championship round okay. that I was against myself. Uh, shot 84. I'm playing uh, tomorrow, Thursday, and Friday. Um, I got to tell you, Drake, you know I'm a little bit anxious about health and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Health thing, uh, creeps me out and makes me really anxious. I felt really safe on the golf course with the measures that they took. Um, like you, you don't touch the flag. There are no rakes in the bunkers. Um, the driving range is closed. The putting green is closed. We could only play in uh, groups of three. It felt kind of normal, but nice. the tee times were spaced out 12 minutes instead of a normal seven. Like you didn't see anybody. I felt really safe. Good. I, I hope other people get to experience uh, this little bit of normalcy. Yeah. Because really, honestly, it did wonders for my mental health. Well, it's, it certainly sounds like a safe environment. Why not a, a shout out to the, the, the golf course that you play on on a regular basis? Yeah, that's a Seymour golf and country club in, in uh, North Vancouver. Um, man, those guys were, they were really diligent about making sure that people were following the protocols, no carts, yeah. no pull carts, uh, two different uh, pros driving around to make sure the social <laughs> distancing was respected and um it's not easy for them uh certainly it's a business and they're trying to be open as much as possible but um i thought they did a fantastic job getting off the ground yeah i i'm gonna uh mention my club which is royal ashburn not far from home both my kids actually work there when they're able to work uh but it was a break for me earlier today as we're recording here on wednesday but also somewhat depressing and I appreciate, you know, the the health standards here and, and the fact that Ontario just is in a position yet to, to open golf courses. Um, but because these golf courses have to, you know, plan and order all of their golf gear, their apparel at such an early time, like pro shops aren't opening anytime soon, right? Probably right. at no yeah. point, probably at no point this summer. Um you know, you can do it one of two ways. You can either make an appointment and go in individually and without touching anything, shop and point at the merchandise that, that you like and you want, um, or you can do it virtually. So I did that um, this morning, Wednesday morning, and, and I feel badly for this group because, man, they're selling this stuff off at discount prices. They, 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 they just don't have a choice. They've got to move it. But in saying that, you know, for the 30 minutes that I spent in the parking lot <laughs> looking at the golf course and then it felt good. It's going to sound crazy to spend a little bit of money um, buying something that I like, which is golf shirts and shorts and all that. But also knowing that, you know, you're helping the local economy to some degree. So. Well, um, the just down the road is a public course and they're full. Um, as, as much as they are allowing right. for tea times, like people are looking as we're well aware for any, anything that seems normal. However, there's certainly going to be some things golf, one of them that are easier to start than an adult rec league at a hockey rink. Like, how are for you sure. going to keep that clean yet? Those are businesses too. Yeah. And I, and I totally sympathize with them as well. No question. All right, Ray. Well, until next week, I'm sure we'll have somebody fabulous lined up for episode 31 of the podcast. Uh, enjoy the rest of the week, the weekend. Don't forget Mother's Day on Sunday, and uh, oh. we'll reconnect. I'm, I'm waiting to hear next week what your grand surprise was for Holly. <laughs> I'm sure it's, uh, it's exquisite, and uh, your kids should be on top of this. Chop, chop to them, too. Happy Mother's Day, everybody. All right, Ray. Thank you. Uh, as always, we want your feedback on the podcast, rate the podcast, share it so other hockey fans and sports fans in general, uh, in general can find it as well. 
and want to uh, thank all those who are doing that right now. And those of you who have subscribed to the Rain Dregs podcast. And as we talked about earlier in the podcast, you can now find us and subscribe to the podcast on YouTube. We're doing it on video each week. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but uh, you let us know uh, via our YouTube channel. Thanks to Aaron the Tech Johnson for producing the Rain Dregs Hockey Podcast. And finally, another big thank you to our good pal, Tony Ferraro, for providing the unbelievable music you hear each week as well. Look forward to episode 31. Be well, everybody.